I, I believe that we are, that there is a move of God that's coming to Australia. It's been promised, it's been spoken of. We call, we're called the Great South Land of the Holy Spirit. Uh, different uh, ministries that came many, many years ago, some a hundred years ago, uh, prophesied about a great outpouring of God's Spirit that was going to come into Australia and that God was going to raise up many, many people and He was going to broadcast them and send them out throughout the lands of the, of the world. And I believe that that's going to happen. We are not some exclusive brethren. We're not some ex exclusive people bunch of people. Wherever God's people are hungry, it doesn't matter where, what denomination, what, what nation, wherever people are hungry for God, God will come. God will feed hungry people. So when I speak about us, when I speak about, uh, uh, about different things that I believe that God wants to do, I'm not trying to say that we are the only ones. I'm not trying to say that we are exclusive and that God will only use us. No. God will use anybody. But I can only speak about us, amen? And what God is going to do through us if we're willing and so forth and so forth. But I believe that there is coming a move of God and that move of God is going to be a release and a revelation of the glory of God. A release and a revealing and a revelation and understanding of the glory of God. You see, when, when we got born again, it wasn't just something that we do that because you come to church. And you know, we've, we've made a, a joke of it many, many times that I, I went into the chook house the other day and I didn't become a rooster. Coming to church won't make you a Christian, but giving your life to Christ will. Receiving Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life. And when you get born again, it's a supernatural experience. It's not a natural thing. You see, we go from death to life and you know when we when we share the word of god in our natural mind it might sound strange but you see we have to understand the language of the bible we've got to understand the language of the spirit we've got to understand what it is and what god's saying and not trying to understand it necessarily with our natural mind but by faith, receiving what Jesus said. He said to uh, a man by the name of Nicodemus, he said, you must be born again. Marvel what I, I say to you. And there's a lot of people that go, to Christ that go to church today that think that all is well, and it's really not. You see, you've got to give your life to Christ. You've got to surrender your life to, to God. You see, he takes me from the kingdom of darkness, which is death, and he takes me into the kingdom of his son, which is light and life. And there's a transfer. There's something that happens in the realm of the spirit that only experience can tell you. See, when you've been born again, you know what it is. And David's talking about your first love and he's talking about something there that happened. That's not a natural thing. It's a supernatural thing. And that first love, when, 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 when all of a sudden you're consumed and you feel uh, uh, somebody that you never actually met in the natural, but you've met in another realm, in the realm of the Spirit, to be able to say today that we can fall in love with a man by the name of Jesus, who we've never really seen, but we've experienced. It's a, it's a, it's a work of the Spirit. And a lot of times we can, we can do things. You see... If we don't understand this, without that knowledge, it's without an ongoing revelation of His Spirit, we go back to living Christianity in the flesh. And there's a lot of people, as David was sharing today, remember your first love because God wants to take us back to that. Otherwise, there's a lot of people that have had that experience that we go back to living our Christianity in the natural realm. And it's never meant to be lived like that. It's only been meant to live in the realm of the Spirit. We go back to living out Christianity in the flesh, not in the Spirit. The Bible says, there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof is death. You see, if we're living Christianity in the flesh, it's another word for it is called religion. It's just religious. The, sp the Bible speaks much about doors. Doors are to go through. 
There's something that you go into. Jesus said, I am the door. No man can come to the Father except through me. And so when you get born again, you come into Jesus and you go through a door and you go into something. It's not just a door. That door is an entrance into the realm of the Spirit, into a whole new way of living. We used to sing a song back in the old days, I found a new way of living. I found a new life divine. I have the fruit of the Spirit. Man, it's coming back. I'm abiding, abiding in the vine. In a minute I'll start dancing. And we used to sing that continually, continually, continually. And, and you see, there's doors, doors you go through to enter into another place, another experience, another encounter, another revelation, more understanding. Jesus Christ is the door, but there are many other doors that we must pass through. Jesus speaks about, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Keys open doors. Doors into the supernatural. Doors into, a, into a, another whole new way of living. And you know, when we capture this, when we start to understand this, that it is a whole new way of living and we start to uh, draw from that and we start to experience that, something happens because on the inside of us, there's a, a man, a real man, the spirit man. You see, it is very obvious that I feed the outer man very well. <laughs> but you see, there's an inner man. There's an outward man, and this outward man is perishing. Just have a look. David talked about, he knew me 40 years ago. I look a lot different today. <laughs> a lot of things have fallen out. <laughs> yeah. You don't have to say amen to that. <laughs> but, but there's an inward man. And when I say I'm excited and I'm age is only a number and goodness knows what, it's this inward man that is being renewed day by day. And you see, when I understand that and the language of the Bible, when I understand that, then I will not look at this outward man an outward man and other people look at you and they say, oh, Neil, you should re retire or you should do this or you should do that. No, but the inward man is being renewed day by day. This inward man now is stronger than it's ever been. This inward man now is, is, is more alive than it's ever been in my life. It knows more. I've learned more. I've experienced more. I've grown more in God. I'm ready to do something for God. Hallelujah. Amen. And when you understand the spirit world and that which God wants to reveal to us, then you start to draw upon that, that inner being. You draw upon your strength. You draw upon that and you find yourself doing exceedingly abundantly above whatever you could have ever imagined or thought. If we listen to our, our, our natural man, our natural man, you just go over and die. I've got a, I've got a saying that I say and I'm going to continue to say it until whenever, but don't die till you're dead. I've seen too many people die before they're dead. They give up. Don't give up. Get a hold of God, amen. Get, believe in God. God has already filled us with His glory. The Bible, I want you to read some scriptures with me this morning in Psalm uh, 24, and, and we can recite this, but sometimes I get it a little bit wrong. And because uh, I get excited sometimes. Anybody notice that? <laughs> Psalm 24, amazing uh, verses here. And it says here in verse 7, it says, Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Be ye lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. How many people want the King of glory to come in? Well, I want to tell you, you've got something to do about this King of glory. It's not just going, saying, I'm a Christian. Now, if you want the King of glory, it says, hey, this is what I want you to do. Lift up your heads. Devil will put you down. He'll put condemnation on you. He'll have you eaten, grumbling, and goodness knows what. No, I want to tell you the best thing you can do this morning is lift up your head. Hallelujah. Lift up your head, O you gates, and be you lifted up, you everlasting doors. And then the 
King of glory will come in. Hallelujah. Then the King of glory will come in. He just doesn't come in when we're playing tiddlywinks, playing religion. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors. And the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Hallelujah. He wants to fight for us. He wants to fight through us. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. He is the champion. He is the one that wants to rush on in. You see, God has already filled us with His Spirit. He's already touched us. He's already in us. One John, John 1 verse 1 it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. You believe that? And the Word was God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Verse 4, In Him was life. And the life of was the light of men. See, when I invited Jesus Christ into my life, I, I was a miserable wretch. I was a hopeless mess. But you see, what I invited into my life, if you understand the language of the Bible, when I, op when I opened my life and I invited Him in, I ought to tell you, it just wasn't some little thing that we did at church. I ought to tell you the King of glory came in. I ought to tell you the life came in. The life of God came into me. I received life that day. I will live forever. Hallelujah. You don't have to get so excited in this Presbyterian church. You see, I, I was filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. I have the power of God. I have the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwelling in me. It's not something out there. He's not fluffing around out there playing church. He's in me, amen. He's in you. Do you believe that today? Stir up the gift that's within you. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up your everlasting doors, and the King of glory will come in. <laughs> hey, the King of glory wants to come in. He wants to invade our lives. You see, we, we've been anointed with healings, and goodness knows what. All we have to do is re receive and release. Receive and release. Acts chapter 3. We know this scripture only so well. You know, they were there, these, the disciples. Who were they? They were a bunch of fishermen. But all of a sudden something happened. Something dra dramatic happened in their lives. They were in an upper room. They were, they were in fear. They didn't know what was going to happen to their lives. But God and all His wisdom and all His knowledge, the Bible says there was a sound of a mighty rushing wind and it filled the whole place where they were seated. Amen. And there were tongues of fire and they began to speak in another language. They were filled with the Holy Ghost and with power. That same Spirit is in you today. But what did the disciples do with it? They just didn't go over in a corner there and start having a shanda or a Monday. They just didn't sit around babbling and, and, and that. No, it says there that the power of God got on the inside of them. And after that experience, it says the next day that they went to the temple to pray. And on the way to the temple, they found a man that had been lame from his birth. These guys here that had never really seen too much but all of a sudden now, they go to this man who was asking for alms, and they said these words that you've got to allow these things to resonate in your mind that cause, to cause us to do something. They said, silver and gold I do not have, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, arise and be healed. And immediately the ankle bones and the knee bones and the hip bones and other, other bones... <laughs> whatever the bones, <laughs> all came together and the man went leaping and raising, running around the place praising God. We could look at that person, we could say, Peter and John, who do you think you are? No, 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 friend, don't you let the devil tell you that. Don't, look, you've got more inside of you than you'll ever know, but until you release it, it will not go out. They could have just walked up to that guy and said, oh, you poor fellow. I know you've been in that wheelchair for so long. Here's a couple of dollars. 
They had something on the inside of them. I'm going to say it over and over again. You've got to understand the language of the Bible. We've got to get rid of carnal thinking. We've got to get rid of natural thinking. We can't think like a mere man. We've got to think like a spirit man. Greater is he that's within me than he that's within the world. Go lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Cast out demons, whatever God wants you to do. Silver and gold I do not have. That's in Acts chapter 3. God Almighty, hallelujah. Revelation 3.20 says this. It says, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. You see, God, Jesus is a door, but I want to tell you that there's a door in your life as well. And many of us as people of God, Christians or whoever we are, many times we shut, shut those doors. We might have been hurt. We might have been disappointed. Something's happened in our life. And so we shut the doors. He wasn't talking to any. He was talking to the church. We shut doors in our lives. But I want to tell you, Jesus doesn't want you to keep that door shut. He says, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If you open the door, I will come into you and I will sup with you and you with me. And I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom. I'm going to do something in your life. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. God is always wanting to bring the church into His purpose. He's always wanting to bring you into His purpose. When Jesus paid the ransom uh, for our redemption, the church, the curtain was rent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens a door, if you're here this morning and you, and you hear his voice or you, you feel the pull or, or whatever it is, your natural mind will be arguing with you. But if you say, come in, he will come into you. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my Father on His throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Listen to the Spirit, not your feelings. Listen to the Spirit, not your feelings. I'm speaking to somebody right now. I'm going to say it again. Listen to the Spirit and not your feelings. When God moved, that, that curtain was rent, torn apart, split apart. That which separated God from man or man from God was taken down. In Isaiah 22, verse 22, it says, the key of the house of David I will lay on his shoulder. I'm talking about doors. I'm talking about keys. I'm talking about opening. I'm talking about releasing. I'm talking about allowing the kingdom to come in. I'm talking about lift up your heads. Let the king of glory come in. If there's ever a time we need to open our hearts to let the king of glory, let the power of God penetrate us, it's today, amen. It's got to be this hour we're living in. I heard the other day or yesterday or in, in, in Noosa that there are witches running around the place. Glory to God. Anyhow. Isaiah 22, verse 22, it says, The key of the house of David I will lay on his shoulder. So he shall open and no one shall shut. And he shall shut and no one shall open. I want to tell you, friends, today, whether we believe it or not, I'm not trying to open the door. I believe that the door is already open. See, that's another... We're trying to open up a door that's already open. Trying to scratch an itch. The doors are already open. He's got the key. He's opened the door. No one will, will shut it. There's other doors that he shut that no one will understand. No, no one will open, rather. 
What we really need to understand in our natural mind is that God is in total control. Amen? God is in total control. Do you remember that we had a word from God? We had a visiting ministry from America. And the word was that God was going to restore the house of David to this people. This will happen wherever people are seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. I want to say it again and again and again. We are not exclusive. We are not the only people that God is touching. We are not the only people that God is moving on. We are not the only people that God's going to use. We are not the only... Can I get that through us? We are not the only people, but I can only talk about this people. What God wants to do in us, amen. What He's done in us, He will do in others. And I pray that there will be multitudes and multitudes and multitudes. Jesus uses keys to open doors, to release revelation, power, whatever it is. I want you to have a look with me in the book of Matthew chapter 16. We doing okay? When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, Who do men say that I the Son of Man am? See, I believe that Jesus is trying to separate the natural from the spiritual. Because you see, our spirit man thinks he knows best. When we hear the Spirit of God, usually our first reaction is, that sounds stupid. How can I lay this hand on somebody's cancer and believe that it will be healed? That sounds stupid to me, but that's what God says to do. Amen? Who are we going to believe? Who are we going to believe? Who do men say that I the Son of Man am? And they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, some others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Bajona, for flesh and blood, natural thinking, has not revealed this to you, but my Father, spiritual thinking, who is in heaven, he has revealed this to you. Blessed are you. And I also say to you that you are Peter. And on this revelation or on this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. It's, or what that word prevail means, it's, it says it will not be victorious over it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Natural, spiritual. Natural, spiritual. Jesus uses keys. He says, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom. I want to say to you today, if he's given you the keys of the kingdom, go open some doors. <laughs> go release some things. Speak to the mountain. Bind the strong man. Loosen the kingdom. There are things in the life of the church that closes doors. Things that God doesn't like. I want you to have a look with me in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 6. How are we going for time? I've got plenty. Plenty of time. Somebody said, no, you haven't. <laughs> Get me out of here. In the year of King Uzziah, when the, when, sorry, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and his train of his robe filled the temple. I'm going to mostly share the rest of this passage next week. 
So I'm, for time's sake, I won't go into that right now. But in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. The, key, the year King Uzziah died, why did Uzziah have to die before Isaiah saw the Lord? Why did he have to die in order for this man, something happened that he could then see God, could see the Lord high and lifted up, train filling the temple. Saw him and all his, who talks about cherubims, talks about some amazing things that we're going to share next week. Chronicles 26, 1 through 22, and I'm not going to read that either. You might want to make a note of it. You might want to read it. Describes the life of Uzziah. Uzziah. He became king at the age of 16. At this time, he was totally dependent on the Lord. And it's a bit like as if the same Holy Spirit that was talking to David while he was preparing for communion was the same Holy Ghost that was talking to me. Because you see, this man lost his first love. When he first got, became king, he was totally dependent on the Lord, seeking the Lord continually. The Lord caused him to prosper. I want to read a scripture right now. It's found in Hebrews chapter 2. And I believe that it's an amazing scripture. Hebrews is always hard for me to find. Anybody got Hebrews in their Bible? There it is. There it is. I got it. I got it. Stop looking. Stop looking. Listen to this very, very carefully, please. Therefore, verse, chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore. What do you say when you see a therefore in the Bible? You've got to see what it's there for. God's wanting to get our attention. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things that we have heard, lest we drift away. When you lose your first love, you drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proves steadfast in every transgression, and disobedience received a just reward or a just penalty, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? If we lose our first love, if we lose our desire, if we lose it, and this man had a great desire for God. He loved God. He, he, he was totally dependent upon God. There's a lot of people today that started in the, in the church today that, that love God with all their heart, but they've drifted away. And they've gone back into religiosity, religion, religious thinking. You see, at some point in this man's life, he found a, play, a pride, found a place in his heart. Something that wasn't made by God got inside him. He thought himself above the commandments of God, above the Word of God. He went in and offered incest uh, to the Lord rather than allowing the priesthood to do so. Pride, arrogance, whatever it might be. See, today it may not be pride. It may be something else, things that get around our lives, things that get in and take the place of God, things that, that dry us up. Because of his pride, he was struck with leprosy and stayed in that condition until he died. Leprosy always speaks in the Bible about separation from God. So I suppose we could read this in a different way. In Isaiah 6, it says, The day pride died, I saw the Lord. The day selfish ambition, self-centeredness, Whatever it might be, the day that died, I saw the Lord. The, ch the church is allowed in what God has not permitted. Whenever there was a new king came on the scene and they loved God, the first thing that God spoke to them about was pulling down the high places. And I believe that in the church today, there are many things that have come into the church that should never have come in. They've got to be pulled down. 
Something's got to be done about it. We've got to raise up a standard against what the enemy has sown in. It's got to be pulled down. It's got to be taken away. It says that they cut down and pulled down the high places and they, they did this and they did that and they did what was right in the sight of God. The life we live on earth, we must learn and understand why Jesus said to us, take up your cross and follow me. He knew the troubles, he knew the problems. I believe that we have to embrace the crucified life. This work, life that we live now is not tiptoeing through the tulips with Tiny Tim. Anybody notice there's a few battles go on? Bit of warfare, bit of struggle, bit of striving, bit of problems. We have to embrace a crucified life. It's not enough to say, I'm a Christian, I'm going to heaven. It's not enough to say that. Thank God for the free gift. Thank God for the free gift. But it costs God everything. It costs Him His best. The most precious. I believe that God is looking for Christ-like character in us. And every one of us have got choices. I think that was a good sign to stop. <laughs> Can't better that one. Father, Father, help us. I pray today that, that we can comprehend somehow or other what I believe the Spirit of God is wanting to say to us. Pray, Lord, that you're wanting us to, to live that sanctified life, embrace the cross, Lord, understand that we're on this planet for a purpose and a reason. And Lord, I just pray today that every wall will come down, every stronghold will be smashed. That we, your kids, Father, would, would somewhere or other just totally surrender to you and, and ask you to have your way. I believe, Lord, that we are in for the right of our life. I believe, Lord, that all the things that we've been praying for and hearing he, hearing heard prophesied over us and things like that are about to come to pass. Australia is going to know a move of the Spirit. It is going to know a revival. And Lord, I know that we had words I can remember 40 plus years ago of little fires lighting up all over the nation. And Father God, I pray that we could be just one of those little fires. And those fires begin to burn and, and there's a as the vision unfolded, the people used to say that they saw that the fire was starting to come together. And instead of just little fires, it became one big fire. So, Father, I'm just asking you today, Lord, if there's things, Lord, that w where we are today, that we just need to surrender to you, let it surrender. Can I just say this? A lot of people have come to me and over the years and as a pastor and and I've had theology problems sometimes <laughs> and uh, one of those problems that I had was about water baptism and um, I, I saw people getting re-water baptized and I said oh that's wrong and I remember Nancy and I I had cold shoulder and <laughs> for a long time because <laughs> when we went to uh, Israel and Nancy was so wanting to be water baptized in the Jordan and I rebuked it and but she didn't take any notice of me and she went in and and she had the time of her life in there and had a, had an encounter with God I just had the molly grubs miserable thing that I was cold tongue and hot shoulder or whatever it is <laughs> for a couple of days but anyhow we got over it but I come to realize now that a lot of people 
that when they got water baptized, only did it because somebody else was doing it. And, I, and again, I have troubles when I see water baptisms and anybody else want to get done? They, oh no, it's, it's, it's deeper than that. <laughs> it's more than that, isn't it? It's getting, otherwise, you just go in dry and come out wet. Too many people just go on in dry, come out wet. And I really felt while I was preparing this, I didn't get to it, that part. <laughs> Might get to it tomorrow, next time. But I really feel that there are people here that when you got water baptized, you might have got baptized as a kid and it didn't really mean much to you. But somehow or other, God's going to put it on your heart to follow him fully and wholly and solely. And you'll want to go through the waters again properly where it can mean something to you. And so, I'm just, if, that, if you feel like that, talk to me. If you want change to come into your life, talk to me. And let's believe God to do something, amen? Let's believe God to do something. Get us ready. Amen.